Okay, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our one year to COP, um, an introduction, introduction to climate change issues and uh, Glasgow's COP26 for young people. Uh, my name is Kate Kirkwood. I am the climate change youth officer uh, as part of the Giving Nature Home team with RSPB, and I'll be hosting uh, this evening. Um, just before we actually get started, there are a few housekeeping points that I want you all to be made aware of. This session is being recorded and it will be available to view after the webinar, which is also being live streamed currently on RSPB's YouTube channel. We ask that you don't take any photos or screenshots of people while they're presenting, uh, but please do share your thoughts on our social media channels uh, with the hashtag one year to cop. And if you are posting uh, online, make sure you tag us as RSPB Scotland. You'll notice there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Please post any questions you have throughout the presentations to the Q&A box, um, which will be monitored by my colleagues, uh, Becca and Sarah Jane. Uh, we will be doing a short Q&A session after each of the presentations, rather than one at the, all at the end. Um, so please pop any questions you have on a particular presentation during this time, rather than waiting until the end. Please note that depending on time, we may not be able to get through all of the questions, in which case we'll look back at everything we get and we'll come back to you after the event. As we have a range of ages attending this evening, um, I have a few safeguarding points just to mention to you all. Um, if you are under the age of 16, you will need to have a parent or a trusted guardian with you while you're watching this video and webinar. As this is a webinar, your video and audio has automatically been disabled, which means no participants will be able to see or hear each other except from the panelists. Um, we have also recommended that you join us uh, from a communal space in your home where possible. We also kindly ask that we all work to make this a positive and safe space for everyone. Discussing climate issues can be challenging and emotional for many of us. So we ask that you're respectful during this session. Um, offensive comments or bad language, unfortunately, will not be tolerated. It is World Kindness Day today, so bear that in mind when you're, when you're posting comments. If we do see anything of this like during the webinar, um, we will have to remove you. So now that's all out of the way, that's all the formal things. And um, we're delighted to have you all join us this afternoon for the One Year to COP event. This is marking one calendar year until the postponed UN FCCC COP26, which is a mouthful to say, to be held in Glasgow. We'll be telling you more about that as we go on. So as I said, my name is Kate and I'm the COP26 Climate Change Youth Officer with RSPB Giving a Nature a Home, Glasgow and Edinburgh, that has been working in these cities for the last seven years. The climate project began in early March um, of this year, and we had high hopes for lots of face-to-face -face meetings, workshops and celebrations. But it seems like for so many others as well, that 2020 had other plans for us. Um, we have been resourceful and like many others have been learning how we can still work with and for young people virtually. I've been meeting regularly online over the last eight months with a fantastic group of young people who I hope are joining us this evening who have helped us to create uh, today and tonight's sessions and have made this event possible. So thank you in advance from them. We have spent some time exploring how we meet online, how COVID-19 has changed our daily lives and how to work collaboratively when we can't be face to face and in order to reach fellow young people about climate change, biodiversity loss and the importance of COP26. Climate emergency, our house is on fire and there's no planet B, maybe phrases that are familiar to you. Maybe you heard about this big COP climate thing in Glasgow, but weren't really sure where to start finding out more. And one of the key themes that came out of our conversations with the young people was the, the challenge in finding accessible information about what COP26 is and why it's important. So today we're gonna to take you on a short journey, which will hopefully give you some background and context for why we think it's important 
that you understand COP and why it's relevant for young people. So before we get introduced to our speakers, we have a quick poll that's going to come up on your screens that's just going to ask you a quick question about what you feel, how informed you feel about these topics uh, that we're talking about today. So your options are very informed, quite informed, a little informed, not informed at all, or I'm not sure. Click on one of these and we'll see the results in just a second. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much for sharing that with us. Um, we seem to have a quite informed audience tonight, but if you're not sure or you're not feeling terribly informed right now, hopefully that will be different by the end of today's session. Okay. So tonight we have an exciting panel of speakers um, who will be talking about a whole host of different subjects from the biodiversity crisis, climate crisis, talking a little bit about climate science, how we can link the two together and understand them as twin crises. Um, and we will also be hearing about the importance of biodiversity and the importance and relevance of the UNFCCC uh, COP26 climate change conference that will be held in Glasgow and why it's important to young people as well. So to start us off um, this, this afternoon, we have Fiona Dobson, uh, Fiona has worked as a global policy assistant at the RSPB since January of this year. Her work spans international biodiversity and climate policy, working to raise global ambition for strong international, in, international environmental agreements, especially at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity and the UNFCCC. She also works to connect global policy with local actions, especially through promoting nature-based solutions. And I'd like to welcome Fiona to her presentation. Hello, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today and thanks for the introduction, Kate. Um, I'm going to be kicking off today's session um, by introducing some of the main uh, concepts that we'll talk about today. And then the other speakers will be giving a little bit more detail. And as Kate said, you're free to ask us any questions at the end of each talk. So I'm going to be exploring with you how nature and climate are really interlinked. If you like, they're two sides of the same coin. So what we do to nature, we do to climate. And what we do to climate affects nature. So basically, when people think about climate change, they often don't think about how that affects nature. But really, we've been finding more and more that nature is one of the biggest solutions that we have to address climate change. So, we'll just get the, there we go. Um, as you know, uh, given the here today, we're facing a really big crisis of climate change, but we've got a twin crisis that we're facing that Kate mentions. So the climate change side, as you um, probably already know, is that the way we've been living as humans has been affecting how um, our climate is responding. We've been releasing gases into the atmosphere that have caused our planet to warm. And that has all sorts of effects like um, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, increased likelihood of flooding. And you'll hear more about that from Eve shortly. But at the same time, something you might know less about, but is equally important, is that we're also facing a biodiversity crisis. We're losing species at an astonishing rate. At the moment, about 1 million species are at risk of being lost to us forever. And you'll hear more about that from Ewan. But it's not just uh, losing species forever, it's also the species that used to be really common in the UK, like the turtle dove, for example, that you might have heard of in the 12 days of Christmas. Its numbers are rapidly declining. And we really need to do something about that, not just for biodiversity, but also for climate. So these two crises are actually very interlinked. They're not happening on their own. Climate change is one of the biggest drivers of nature loss and nature loss affects climate change. So if you like, climate needs nature and nature needs the climate. And it's up to us to try and work out how we can link solutions to both of these problems together. 
And COP26 is a really important moment to get our leaders to do this, to address both problems at the same time. And we can push them to make sure they do just that. So let me explain in a little bit more detail what I mean. First of all, let's look at why climate is important for nature. So just like us, uh, species rely on, or, or they need certain conditions in which to live happily. They have this amazing ability to be able to change over time as conditions change, but that's only over really long timescales that things can, the species can evolve. And at the moment, our climate is changing more rapidly than um, it has in a long time. And that means that those species aren't always able to change fast enough. And that is why climate change is one of the biggest drivers that we have uh, to biodiversity loss. And you can see here some of the effects that climate can lead to for, for nature. It can cause species to have to move to new places. And that means there's different mixes of species in a place. And that can affect things like the food web, which is quite delicate. It can also change the timings events. So for example, if you get caterpillars that are hatching earlier in the spring, that means that when the baby birds arrive, there's less food for them to eat. It can also cause stress, just like us. If, they, if animals are facing lots of uh, more, more storms, for example, that leads to stress. And it can also cause physical damage to ecosystems. You can see here an example where we have coral bleaching that's caused by repeated warming events in the ocean. And then the other side of the coin is the, is the fact that healthy biodiversity is important for climate change mitigation. So it's not just um, that nature or that climate is important for nature, but healthy nature is important for the climate. And mitigation basically means that we're, we're working to lessen the effects of climate change and, and halt it if we can. And nature plays an important role in this because um, healthy ecosystems absorb and store carbon as part of their natural processes. Um, and that's really important because it means that nature is taking out these gases from the atmosphere where they're causing warming. And it's actually thought that about 60% of all of the emissions, the gases that we release every year as humans, the equivalent of 60% is absorbed by, by uh, vegetation and soils. So that's really great. And some habitats are particularly important for that, like forests, and I'll get onto that in a second. But if we damage these special places, they can then release the stored carbon and have an opposite effect. So we need to work with nature. So here are the um, Forests absorb about 2.6 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. And that's about a third of all the carbon dioxide that we release by burning fossil fuels every year. So that's a really big amount. But if we damage them, if we deforest them, for example, they contribute to climate change by releasing carbon dioxide. So we need to look after our forests in order for them to look after us. It's a similar story with peatlands. So uh, there's a lot of peatlands in Scotland. So hopefully if some of you are listening from there, you'll have been to a peatland. It's a specific type of wetland that has some um, soils that are made up of dead plant material. It's a bit squishy when you walk on it, you'll, you'll recognize it if you're walking on peat. And these areas cover about 3% of the total land surface of the earth, and they absorb a huge amount of carbon. That's in gigatons, that number there, which is a very big number of carbon dioxide. But just like with forests, if we damage these areas, for example, by burning, they then release carbon dioxide. And that has the opposite effect. So we need to protect them. But I want to say here before I go on that, Working with nature in these ways to mitigate climate change is just part of the solution. That has to come alongside reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we're releasing. We can't rely on nature alone, but we need to work with nature alongside adjusting our habits. So not only is uh, biodiversity important for climate change mitigation, but it's also important for adaptation, which means getting used to the effects of climate change, helping us as humans to get used to it and become stronger. So if you have lots of different species in an ecosystem, it's able to better uh, function despite climate change. And that means it can keep providing us with the services that we rely on from it. And if we protect and we restore places and we, we create more green spaces, that also gives us services. So for example, if you restore floodplains, that can help uh, floodplains like in this, in this picture, it can help us to uh, um, adapt to more flooding events that might happen with climate change. And if we create more green spaces in our cities, that can help us to cool down and it can also help do other things like um, improve air quality. 
a really cool example of a, a way that nature provides adaptation to us is mangroves. So they're a really um, great type of plant that grows at the edge of water and they provide amazing um, protection against storms. They can absorb the wave energy uh, in storms and protect communities that live behind these plants, these uh, on the coastlines from the impact of those storms. So um, this is actually a photo of me when I was younger. I grew up in a tiny island called Bermuda in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And we really relied on mangroves there to protect us during hurricanes. You can see a, a close up image there. The plants grow in the water literally. Um, that's obviously on a calm day. I definitely would not be uh, kayaking in the middle of a storm. But the really sad thing is that mangroves are one of the most threatened ecosystems in the world. We've lost about a third of our mangroves already. And that's really tragic. So we need to make sure we protect our remaining mangroves so that they can protect us. So let's think about how we can connect nature and climate, use these connections between nature and climate to drive action. So a really cool thing that's emerged relatively recently is this idea of nature-based solutions. And that means that nature can help us to solve our problems such as climate change. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, you know, uh, nature has been helping us all through human history. And all of the examples I mentioned so far, like looking after forests and peatlands and mangroves, those are all nature-based solutions. But lately, uh, governments and businesses and, and individuals have been using this term to help to raise the importance of nature in the conversation, um, and especially how important it is in our fight against climate change. And at the same time, carrying out these nature-based solutions, they also help to protect biodiversity and they give us benefits for human well-being, which is really important for all of us. And you'll hear more about nature-based solutions from Caitlin in a little bit, but I just wanted to finish by giving um, you a little bit of a real world example of a nature-based solution. So a lot of you might not realize, but the RSPB is involved in some really cool projects um, in different countries. And an example of this is in the Golo Rainforest, which is an area of forest in Sierra Leone and Liberia. That's two countries in West Africa. And the size of the forest is almost 23 times the size of Glasgow. So that's a really big forest. And we're working with local communities to look after that forest. And that has benefits for biodiversity, for climate and for people. And that people aspect is really important. So it protects biodiversity because um, it's a global biodiversity hotspot, which means that there are species there that are found nowhere else in the whole world. This species in uh, uh, the photograph of the bird, I could never pronounce it right. It's a white necked picarthus, I think it's called. Um, and it's a beautiful striking bird, as you can see. Uh, the forests also help to protect uh, or to tackle climate change because they store millions of tons of carbon. And then they also support local communities. We're involved in a project that helps farmers to grow forest friendly cocoa, which is then used to create this special Gola rainforest chocolate, which is really exciting. So um, just to finish, um, I'd like to you know, highlight that nature is our ally. There are really strong connections between nature and climate and all of us can help to look after nature to ensure that it helps us or keeps helping us in our fight for climate change. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Fiona. That was fantastic. Um, really enjoyed uh, your talk. Thank you so much. Um, I had one quick question that I wanted to ask you. Um, so you talked about species loss uh, from biodiversity loss and links to climate. Um, what, are the some, what are some of the rare species that might go extinct in the UK and are currently at risk? So I use turtle dove as an example. Um, it's quite difficult actually um, to directly link the decline of a species to climate change because it happens over long timescales. But um, there's a lot of activities that um, contribute to decline, such as the way we farm, for example. Um, but turtle doves have been really rapidly declining and there's a RSPB is involved in a program to help uh, uh, restore their populations. And it's also important to note, I'll just say quickly, that a lot of the species we have in the UK migrate. So changing climates in different countries can affect uh, their populations here. So, climate change is global. So if we can uh, tackle that, that'll help change, uh, you know, restore the populations of species across the world. So turtle doves is a good example. Great, fantastic. And we've just had another question come up while we were speaking um, and it links into the, the, the climate around the world. Um, and they've asked, do you think hurricanes are more regular now in places like Bermuda since growing up there? 
So it's kind of difficult to say because obviously I can remember hurricanes better when I was older, but um, they definitely happened all throughout my childhood there. But towards the end of my time, I moved when I, uh, a couple of years ago when I was 18, just like three or four years before I left, every year we had quite a lot of hurricanes, not just one in a year, but sort of repeated. And that makes the effects worse because you're hit by a hurricane, all the trees are down, the power's out, and then a couple of days later you're hit by another one. And that really uh, makes it difficult for, for us to sort of get used to the effects. So that's why we need things like mangroves, which help to reduce the effects of them. So I think it's thought that hurricanes are, are becoming uh, more frequent, but um, again, it's difficult because it's over long time scales. Thank you. That sounds like quite a challenging experience and one that really helps illustrate some of the, the impacts that we see. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, I'm gonna pass on to our next speaker. Um, and we are going to hear from Eve, who is one of the learning officers at Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh, uh, where her role is to design and deliver uh, engaging science programs for all ages. Um, they are a science or an earth science center with an aim of increasing vis visitors knowledge of the world around them and their place in it. So a key part of her role is to help under people understand the science of climate change. And here she is to share uh, some more information with you. Fantastic, thank you very much, Kate. Um, so yeah, like Kate said, uh, my name's Eve and uh, I work at Dynamic Earth. And hopefully today what I'm going to do is take you through a really quick whistle stop tour of some climate science. Obviously climate science is a huge topic, um, so I'll only touch on small amounts of it today. Um, but to start us off, I wanted us to think about um, one of the kind of fundamental things that we talk about a lot in climate science, which is something called the greenhouse effect. Now from that poll at the start of our um, webinar. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of this before, but I'm going to really briefly um, talk about uh, what uh, the greenhouse effect is, just to make sure everyone understands. So, and I've lost my slides. That's not a good start, is it? Right, hang on. <laughs> Here we go. So, fingers crossed. We will have our slides again, maybe. Oh my goodness. Right, here we go, fantastic. Um, so uh, this is a little cartoon that will take us through the greenhouse effect. We've got um, a little picture of the earth and that black line there around the edge is uh, the atmosphere. So we have energy that comes in from the sun and uh, this comes through the atmosphere and bounces off the surface of the earth. Um, then this is trapped by our atmosphere and by some of the gases in our atmosphere. Uh, some of it is radiated back out into space and then some of it is bounced back down to the earth. And this effect is called the greenhouse effect. And it's actually super, super useful. Without the greenhouse effect, uh, there wouldn't be life here on planet earth. We need the greenhouse effect uh, to make it warm enough for life to survive. The trouble is that as humans, uh, we burn fossil fuels and burning fossil fuels adds greenhouse gases, adds these gases to the atmosphere. And when you've got more of these gases, it changes what happens in the greenhouse effect. So uh, the energy from the sun comes down, bounces off the earth, um, but more of it is trapped by these greenhouse gases and reflected back down to the earth. And this is what's causing global warming. But for me, this explanation was never uh, super satisfactory because I didn't really understand what was going on in the atmosphere. So to do that, we need to look at the, the chemical composition, the actual gases that make up our atmosphere. And the majority of uh, our atmosphere is made up of uh, oxygen and nitrogen. We're about 21% uh, oxygen and 78% uh, nitrogen. And you can see uh, these two images are pictures of what the molecules look like of these gases. So the molecules are these little component parts. And there's two atoms and they're really closely, tightly bonded together. Oxygen and nitrogen are not greenhouse gases. What are greenhouse gases are some of the things that are in that last 1% of our atmosphere. And here's a few examples of them. We've got methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide and water vapour. And you can see from these images, even without understanding a lot of what they mean, you've got a much more complex structure. You've got branching bits, double bonds, all these different things. And it's these complex structures inside these molecules that trap the heat energy from the sun. So as we're adding more of these, and carbon dioxide is a big one we talk about a lot, we are adding to this greenhouse effect and warming up the earth. 
Um, so I've made a pretty clear link between the amount of greenhouse gas in our atmosphere and the temperature, but how do we know that the temperature is changing at all? Well, to do that, the first thing you can do is look at um, the temperature records. So we've been measuring temperature on planet Earth, well, from about the 1600s, but only reliably for about the last 250 years. So this graph shows the average uh, annual temperature across the globe for the last 250 years. And although there's a lot of up and down in it, I would say there's definitely an upwards trend, especially as we get from sort of 1970 onwards, you're seeing a real increase in our temperature. However, a lot of people question this information. And there's two reasons for that. The first being that you can see there's a lot of variation and there's a lot of questions about how reliable this information is. There's a lot of problems with the weather stations we use. There's been a lot of studies to show that they're um, not recording the temperature very accurately. Um, so maybe this, this information isn't super accurate. The other problem is it only lasts 250 years. Our planet is 4.5 billion years old. 250 years is a tiny amount of our planet's history. So how do we know this is even unusual? And to do that, we have to think about proxies for working out our planet's temperature. So proxies is just a way of looking at something else that can we can then use to infer uh, how warm the planet was. And I've got a few examples of those here. Um, so there's two main ways that we can infer the temperature. We can either use biological things, we can use the plants and animals, or we can use the chemical things like the greenhouse gases I was talking about earlier. Um, so up there on the top right and on the bottom left, we've got some biological things. The top right is a picture of a sediment core, which is basically you drill a big hole down into the, the sludge at the bottom of the lake, and you look at the layers and you work out what plants were growing around that lake um, thousands of years ago, and you can kind of work out what the temperature is based on what kind of plants you were getting. We can do the same thing if you look down on the bottom left with fossils. So this is a micro fossil in a rock. And so you can do the same thing with rocks, except you can move back thousands of years, more than that, billions of years. So that's really, really useful. The other ways we can do it is looking at the chemistry of our atmosphere. So the top left there, we've got a picture of a satellite. Um, this is the Calypso satellite, which is a NASA satellite that looks at the chemistry of our atmosphere. So it uses lasers to measure how much carbon dioxide there is. And from that, we can use that greenhouse effect. We can work out how warm the planet is. Unfortunately, that only gives us real time data. To get data into the past, to expand that 250 years of data, what we need to do is we need to look um, into ice cores. And that's what I've got a picture of down here at the bottom. Now, ice cores are brilliant. Um, we take ice cores from um, usually from Antarctica or Greenland, where we've got these huge ice sheets. And what's happening in these places is we've got lots of snow falling, but not a lot of snow melting. So what happens is the snow falls and then more snow falls and more snow falls, and it squishes up and squishes up and squishes up and becomes ice. But while the snow is squeezing down on itself, it's also trapping tiny bubbles of air. But it's trapping tiny bubbles of air that are the current atmosphere. And because this builds up over thousands of years, down at the bottom, we've got trapped little bubbles of past atmosphere. So you can take a drill, like the picture on the left there, and drill a big cylinder of ice out of that. And that's what this is, this is an ice core. Now, super conveniently, um, every year, because the snowfall isn't um, the same year round, it's seasonal, you get sort of layering in your ice cores. You can see from this close up picture. And just like tree link rings, you get one a year, the same thing in ice cores, one a year. So you can count backwards and work out from what year you're getting your ice. Well, then you can take that ice and do an experiment like this one, where you put the little bit of ice into a sealed container, you suck out all the air, and then you melt the ice. And that means the only air inside that container is these little bubbles of past atmosphere. Then you can measure how much carbon dioxide is in that atmosphere and use that to work out what the temperature used to be. Now, the advantage of this is we can go back for thousands of years and we can build graphs that look a bit like this one. Now, I know there's a lot going on in this graph, so let me talk you through it. Down at the bottom here, we've got um, thousands of years. So this is from the present day on the right hand side but all the way back 800,000 years. So that's the furthest back we can go with ice cores. On the right hand side, it tells us how much carbon dioxide, which is one of those greenhouse gases that we have in the atmosphere. And that's in parts per million. Um, and on the left hand side, we've got what's called the temperature anomaly. So this is how much we think the temperature has changed from what we should expect. And then there's lots of different colored lines, but that's just different ice core data. So they're all pretty much showing the same thing. And you can see there's these big cycles of change. We've got these big peaks and big troughs. And so some people use that to say, 
well, maybe this is part of a natural cycle. And these are natural cycles that we get in carbon dioxide and temperature on our planet. Um, and these represent our ice ages, which you've probably heard of before. These huge times of global cooling and then global heating when all the ice melts again. But the important thing to consider is this level here. This is our current carbon dioxide level. And as you can see, it is way, way higher, higher, almost 100 parts per million higher um, than anything we've seen in 800,000 years of Earth history. So this is definitely something to be concerned about and definitely something that we have caused to happen. Brilliant. So that is my whistle stop tour of climate science. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. I would like to point out that I'm not a climate scientist. Um, I am an education expert, but um, I will do my best to answer any questions I can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eve. That was a fantastic whistle stop tour. Um, and we do have some questions, but unfortunately, we're going to just move on just now we're a little bit behind time but anyone who has asked a question we will make sure that we do get back to you afterwards um, and if you do have any questions while we're talking please do feel free to put them into the chat box thanks very much eve okay thank you um, we're now going to move on to our next speaker, uh, who has joined us from the Grantham Institute and Imperial College London. Uh, Ewan Furness has a background in ecology as well as geology and paleontology, all of the ologies. Um, the research in his PhD investigates geographical patterns of biodiversity worldwide and it causes and the causes that create them using newly developed computer simulations. So I'd like to welcome you into the screen. Hi there. Share screen. Okay, I hope that's working. Um, great. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Ewan Furness from Imperial College London. I wanted to give you a bit of a deeper dive into biodiversity and why it's being lost and how we can protect it. Uh, a lot of this information is going to be sort of general background information. I wanted to touch briefly on my own research as well, um, just for fun. So there are millions of species of organisms on Earth. There's a breakdown here. We don't actually know exactly how many there are, believe it or not, but it's definitely millions. Uh, you probably know already more about extinction than the best experts in the world did 200 years ago. Because back then, the idea that a species could stop existing actually hadn't really been thought about too much. People figured that what was around today was what had always been around and that it would continue to always be around no matter what humans did. Uh, the idea of extinction, where every single individual in a species dies, came from a few different places. One was fossils of things like dinosaurs. So when people started to discover these, they realized that whatever they were, they weren't around anymore. And so there must have been a time when the last ones died off. The other place the idea of extinction came from was from actually watching it happen. Uh, because people were getting better and better at cataloging and naming the animals in the world around them, they started to notice that some of these animals that they'd named and classified weren't there anymore. And it took them a while to conclude that this was because all of that animal had died, just because that seemed like such a crazy idea. But eventually they figured out that that was what was happening and they called that extinction. Two of the best examples of this are the dodo on the left here, which you've probably heard of before, and the great orc, which is the bird on the right, which you probably haven't, but you may have done. Uh, the dodo was a kind of pigeon. It couldn't fly and it only lived in one island in the Indian Ocean. It was first discovered by sailors who landed on the island in 1598 and it gradually became rarer and rarer until it went extinct around 100 years later. But it took people a long time, uh, over 100 years longer than that, to realize that it had gone extinct because it wasn't an idea that people had had before. So the dodo was very important in that it made people realize that species could go extinct. The great orc was discovered much earlier. They're seabirds, a bit like really big puffins, and lived on rocky coasts all over the west of Europe, including Scotland uh, and the east coast of North America. So it's no surprise that British scientists knew about them from early on because they were right on our doorstep. Uh, they went extinct sometime in the mid 1800s, so about 170 years ago. Nowadays, we've become better at noticing when species have gone extinct. Sometimes extinctions happen naturally without humans doing anything. Uh, for example, there were no humans around when the dinosaurs went extinct, so we can't possibly be blamed for that. 
uh, but natural extinctions are very, very rare. And as you can see on this graph, a lot more species are going extinct now than uh, were a few hundred years ago. Uh, so the extinctions we're seeing now are much too fast for them all to be natural. On top of that, there's a lot of species that we know about now that look like they could go extinct very easily, especially if we don't do anything to protect them. These are endangered species, the ones on the left of the graph here, and there's a lot of them. Some groups are having a harder time than others. So as you can see, gastropods, that's things like snails and slugs uh, at the top of the graph there are doing quite well. Most of them are not endangered, but amphibians like frogs and newts are doing quite badly. Uh, for some groups, if you look at the gray in the middle of each bar, those are the species that we simply don't know enough about yet to know how endangered they are. And that's in some ways just as worrying. So if all this extinction is unnatural, or a lot of it, then why does it happen? Well, there's a lot of different reasons, but the biggest three are invasive species like rats and cats that humans introduce to habitats, which can kill native species or compete with them for resources. Hunting, where humans have killed large numbers of a species, often for a valuable resource like ivory. Or habitat loss, where humans have destroyed the environments where a species lives so that they can use the land for something else like timber or farming. This is often where climate change comes in as well. It can change environments to the point where things that used to live there just can't anymore, even if humans aren't affecting those environments in other ways. I don't want to be all doom and gloom though. Science is telling us ways we can stop extinctions. Sometimes this means making laws that protect animals from being hunted, like with elephants. Sometimes it means getting rid of species that humans have added to habitats by mistake, like rats. Or sometimes it means protecting the places they live so they have enough space to live in and the right habitats to live in. This is some of what my own research looks like, looking at uh, the larger an area of land is, the more species it can protect. So we need to know how to split things up like nature reserves so that they're big enough to support lots of species, but also have different enough habitats that they're not all supporting the same species. It's a difficult balancing act. And there are success stories. So I'll just leave you with a little bit of hope. Uh, this cutie is a Chatham Island black robin. Uh, they very nearly went extinct. In 1980, there were only five of these left in the world, and only one of those five was female. But with a lot of hard work from a lot of dedicated scientists and conservation workers, they recovered. Now there are 250 of them, which is not a lot, but it's much better than it was in 1980. So I hope that this has been interesting enough that you might want to learn more about it in future. And thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ewan. Um, just a wee reminder to everyone, uh, if you do have any questions, do keep them coming in. Um, we would be really interested to hear um, anything you would like to ask. Um, we haven't had any questions for this talk yet, but if you have any burning questions to come in, please do uh, pop them up in the Q&A box and we'll make sure we ask Ewan before we finish up. Thank you again, Euron. That was fantastic and really interesting to see uh, the impacts of species lost uh, across the, the world. Thank you very much. Oh, you. Uh, we are going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, Caitlin uh, is a graduate student who works with local people uh, who look after rivers and the areas around them. She's finding new ways of showing the benefits of natural methods that can pro provide clean water, reduce flooding, tackle climate change and be a home for plants and animals all at the same time. This way, the people who decide what our local areas look like, can make sure they plan for a sustainable future. And I'd like to welcome Caitlin and on you go. Thanks very much, Kate. Let's get this bit ready. Okay. So yeah, as Kate said, I'm a graduate student at the same um, institution as you and we're both at Imperial College London. Um, we're really excited to be here today to introduce you a little bit to what um, research happens at universities on the subject of climate change and biodiversity loss. And I'm here to tell you today that nature is the solution to our problems. And it might not solve everything, but it can do quite a lot. So what we need to do is find sustainable ways of tackling those issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. Unfortunately, nature's really good at reacting to change. As Ewan said, some species move when climate changes to new areas. And yes, sometimes that means we lose species, but also it means sometimes new ones can move in. 
And so let's look at those positives to work out how we can move on in the future and make our environment better for all of those animals, as well as benefiting us in society. Let's look at an example. Here we have a river flowing next to a field. Now, normally in the UK, it actually is quite rainy, not very sunny, unfortunately. And this means that our river level increases. And this causes flooding. It might not be quite as dramatic as a huge tidal wave. It does cover the land. After a period of time when the river goes backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards over the land, soils build up. And this means that new plants can grow in like wetlands. So here we've got a wetland growing now on our floodplain. And that means that new plants and animals can move in and make it their home. Unfortunately, we have been getting in the way of this. And instead of allowing wetlands to grow and allowing plants and animals to live in these nice fields, we built our houses there instead. But housing is important. We need somewhere to live. And there's a lot of people in the UK that don't have a safe place to live. And so to make those houses safe from um, these kinds of floods, this house is obviously at quite high risk from this flood at the moment, we come in and we build walls instead. And this means that um, our flood is stopped from causing huge flood in that house and ruining that person's life. But walls aren't very pretty. They're actually not very good at much else. But instead, let's build wetlands because wetlands have loads of advantages. They can reduce our flood risk because they absorb water, but they also have other things. They provide homes for lots of different species. So plants, um, fish, birds, insects, all of those things can make a wetland their home. But there's other benefits too. They filter water, provide fresh water for us as humans to drink, as well as those animals. And they also absorb all of those gases that Eve was talking about and store them in the soils. And if we leave the soils there, then they're going to store those gases for a really long time and actually start to undo climate change. But there's also some more direct impacts that they have for us as humans. If you build a wetland in a park that often gets flooded, you're going to make other parts of that park better for playing sport and doing other outdoor activities like bird watching or reading a book or going for a walk. And that makes our green spaces more accessible. It also means that flooding is less likely to happen on roads. And that means that getting to work or getting to school is so much more safe. And that's a good thing. And all of these things together mean that our physical and mental health is better. And I'm sure you've all appreciated having a green space nearby during the lockdown, where you've been able to go outside and run around. And what I do in my research is I use maps that are a bit like these to show to the grown-ups that make decisions how all of these benefits are really good for lots of different people and that we should use these rather than building walls that only really benefit. But unfortunately, these benefits aren't really for everyone. And there are walls that exist, barriers, and they're not good. Unfortunately, it's usually the people that um, live with more challenges that are less able to see those benefits things to do with not having enough money or living in different areas of a city or perhaps the culture, meaning that they're less likely to go to those green spaces. And I don't think that's very good. And so in my research, as we are demonstrating these benefits to the grown-ups that make the decisions, we're also saying that actually, hold on, if we're going to build a wetland, we might as well do it in a place that's going to benefit the people that haven't seen those benefits before. Unfortunately, those grown-ups are starting to listen. Nature is the way forward. And the Cairngorms Connect project is a huge thing going on in Scotland where they're using these nature-based solutions to benefit society and the natural environment. And there's also one a little bit closer to home for some of you. There's a pollinator strategy in Scotland, which is building bee corridors so that pollinators like bees and other insects are able to get enough nectar and move between different areas of where nectar and pollen is. And that's really good because it's supporting a species and also supporting something that's going to give us a food source. But most importantly, all of these things are happening with the communities that they're most important to. So you at home are getting involved in using nature as a solution to the climate and biodiversity crisis. And that not only benefits the environment, but it also benefits you. And I hope that you're enjoying doing that because this really is the way forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Caitlin. That was uh, fantastic and really informative as well. Uh, I really like your animations of the wetlands. It really kind of brings it to life. Um, we have had a question come in. Uh, it's quite a brief one, um, but I thought actually it linked very nicely to what you were saying uh, towards the end. And this person was asking about how we can help endangered animals. So you, you showed some pictures there um, of, of strategies that people were doing. Would you like to describe them a little bit more for me? Yeah, of course. So there are loads of ways that we can help endangered animals. And so I think there's probably two things that we can do. The first thing is to identify that they are actually endangered. And that's kind of the research that Ewan was talking about with those red lists, we call them. And that's saying that, OK, actually, this is an animal that we need to protect. protect. But the next thing to do is making sure that their habitat, where they want to live, where they're happy, actually exists and is functioning. So it's all well and good, you know, building a little area for some for some species to live, but only maintaining it for two years. That's only going to mean that that animal can live there for two years. But if we build somewhere that that animal can live for 50, 100 years, then we can actually start to build up a population of that animal that is endangered. So it's all about making a space for nature. That's the, what the RSPB is about, giving nature a home. And that's how we can protect those endangered animals. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Caitlin. We're now going to move on to our final speaker for this evening. Um, we're going to hear from Rachel, who is an undergraduate student at the University of Edinburgh, studying sustainability, sorry, sustainable development and social anthropology. Um, she works as a co-leader of UN House Scotland's climate justice team and is a core member of the COP26 coalition, which is a broad, diverse and inclusive UK-wide coalition organising around COP26. Her background is prim primarily in areas related to justice, policy implementation and youth engagement and youth power. She has worked as an award-winning speaker, artist and advisor on arts-based community development programs in Texas, where she's from, on national level projects for youth voice in social justice issues in the US as a whole, and also as a policy researcher and analyst for a variety of organizations here in the UK. It's a very impressive CV and we're delighted to have uh, Rachel with us uh, this afternoon. And hopefully she's going to come up on screen. Fantastic. I'll pass over to you, Rachel. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I am just going to share my screen real quick and then we will get started. Um, so thank you, Kate, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Rachel and I will be speaking in a sense today to kind of wrap up all of the conversations that we've been having. And to under, we've, we've talked a little bit about the science. We understand a little bit more about the implications of everything that is going on in climate change. And now it's time to ask, what do we as youth have the capacity for to translate this information, not just into meaningful actions, but to create meaningful impacts? To ask, what is the relevance of these really large, complex international political negotiations to our lives and to our futures? And what is the best way for us as young people to be a part of that change? So the first question to ask then is what is COP? Um, COP 26 is an international summit of all the countries which are part of the UN's Climate Change Treaty, which is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change or UNFCCC. 197 countries are a part of this process and they are known as parties to the treaty. How is COP set up? The UK is going to host this meeting, originally planned to take place in Glasgow in November of 2020, but since the COVID pandemic happened, it has now been moved to 2021. That's one of the reasons why this is so important to us is that it's happening right here on our doorstep. COP involves a lot of multilateral decision making, meaning that it happens across many different groups, platforms, levels of power, etc. During the two weeks that negotiations take place um, inside the conference in what's called the blue zone, delegates like politicians, diplomats, and campaigners will hold a bunch of different formal and informal meetings. Businesses and civil society organizations like RSPB 
um, which means charities or activist groups who focus on really challenging issues out in the world, get to contribute as observers. Um, with more than 30,000 delegates and people attending, that means tons of different events, conversations, movement building, and influence on the negotiations. Um, a lot of COP negotiations now revolve around what's called the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is essentially an international handbook for tackling climate change. In it, nations agree um, to reduce the amount of harmful greenhouse gases produced and increase renewable types of energy, such as wind, solar, and wave power to try and keep increases in global temperature well below two degrees Celsius and try to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius and to create a financial system that helps poorer countries recover from potential and potentially mitigate or manage um, different ecological and environmental disasters that may strike. Um, so because the Paris Agreement was created at COP21 in 2015, this makes this next year really big um, in terms of the importance of COP because the Paris Agreement is reviewed every five years. Decisions are being made now by governments around the world that will shape our societies for decades to come. Decisions that can either further entrench local and global inequalities or alternatively, put people and nature-based solutions first. As well, interesting to note, COP26 will be the largest gathering of world leaders ever to take place on British soil. So what is the role of youth then at COP? The UN estimates that there are 1.21 billion young people between the ages of 15 and 24 in the world today. That's 15.5% of the global population. With the climate, youth climate movement growing exponentially, there's developed a space in COP for what's called a youth constituency. Um, at COP, this is called YoungGo. Um, and it consists of many youth-led organizations, groups, delegations, and individual working in climate-related fields. Um, they, in the conference, they run various working groups focusing on specific aspects of climate change, as well as observe and report on the negotiations and the impl implications of their outcomes. Um, but how does one get to that point? I myself haven't gotten there. I won't have ever attended a COP until next year, probably. Um, the bottom line is that while these processes of negotiation and change making will be different depending on where you focus your efforts, if you're looking on an international scale or if you're looking on a local scale with everything that you do in a community or in an educational setting, the issues, no matter what scale you're looking at, will be the same. Back home in Austin, Texas, where I'm from, I started when I was 13 or 14 at an organization called Creative Action, which did public and community art about different justice-related issues. Uh, for example, the Let's Feed Our Neighbors, which is on the screen, was a large-scale mural that we did to talk about food insecurity rates across the region, and especially how farms were suffering, um, in part due to climate change issues. I also was involved for a long time with an organization called Austin Environmental Heroes, which worked on um, planting trees all over the area. To be honest, I kind of stumbled into both, but they started me on a path to get involved with so many different other things that you'll see on the screen that I never in my life would have thought to, I would have been involved in. And all of these on the screen happened when I was really young, below the age of 18, or started when I was 18 or younger. Um, and there are other more informal things too, of course. Um, but what I really just wanna highlight, I put some organizations, RSPB at the center and all sorts of youth related organizations or climate related organizations here in Scotland um, that really focus on all of the issues that we've been talking today about today and are really, really essential and really good starting places if you're looking to get more involved in other things or if you're looking to see what else is out there. Um, and finally, I just want to mention, so uh, Kate introduced that I was working as part of the coalition, COP26 coalition, and right now we are hosting a massive online uh, festival, a uh, five-day festival called From the Ground Up, which engages in all sorts of climate conversations, one of which is an event that RSPB is actually um, hosting, which is called What Does Nature uh, Mean to You? And it's on all sorts of topics that we are kind of like what we've talked about today in this um, 
in this event. And so I highly encourage you to go uh, to that. I can forward you any information, as well as this one called Youth Rise Up. Um, which um, has the Scottish Youth Climate Strike um, and the UKYCC. And um, these are really, really good at looking at, you know, all of these sorts of youth struggles across the world um, and across the UK and what that means for climate justice. So I'd highly recommend going to any of those events if you're looking for access points to more information or to in more conversations. Okay, so my last slide isn't working, but that's okay. There's not much information. Um, I will just uh, speak, uh, I'm sorry for that. Um, we are in uncharted waters. The fight against climate change is quite literally the fight of our lives. Climate justice is not simply about carbon emissions, but is also about the inequalities in the world that are deeply felt and experienced by billions. We face not just one singular crisis of the environment, but multiple crises, that of ecological destruction, of rising temperatures, of biodiversity loss, of poverty, hunger, racism, health, and forced migration. But in the same way that we face multiple crises, we have the potential for multiple solutions. In fact, it's a necessity. In your everyday life, in the big things and small things which you do to engage in climate change, do not ever let someone try to take away your ability or your skills to actively shape your future, to actively shape our future. As young people, our power is to hold two truths, that which we know and that which we don't. In reality, this applies to any person you will ever come across, but there is a way in which young people use the relationship between these truths to our advantage. Sorry, one second, um, to our advantage. Um, that adults often do not. Um, rather than see, um, we, we can understand very deeply the challenges that the world faces and what that means for our futures, but we also don't see the areas where we still have things to learn as a barrier to engagement. In fact, it's our opportunity. Take what you don't know, take your questions, ask them critically. It's through your continuous engagement with your learning, with your everyday interactions with organizations like RSPB or Youth Strikers that these systems begin to change. Um, it's from these continuous multi-generational, multi-organizational commitments to climate and biodiversity movements that I'm reminded again and again of the growth of such enterprises like RSPB's Youth Council, for example, cannot be disconnected from the character of those people who work within it. I always have and always will believe in the power of youth. We find strength and we find meaning in what we work towards. Our power is our hope for the future and in the choices we are making now to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was fantastic and really inspiring as well. Um, I think it's really important that you're able to highlight how youth can be part um, of COP and how it's important to be involved and understand that as well. Um, we are very nearly the end of tonight's session. Um, we do have one question that's come in as well that if um, you'd be able to maybe answer, Rachel. Um, so they've asked, if a young person wants to help with the climate crisis, how can they actively assist? I would say the best way for you to actively assist, um, I see two methods. One is your education and the ways that you learn and continue to learn about the climate crisis. Um, that will always be one of your greatest allies, no matter what. Um, another thing I would recommend is getting involved in organizations like RSPB. Um, or organization that have youth programs um, related to climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, they have support systems that are really good with helping you engage directly um, and paving the way for you to create your own path um, and walk your own path when it comes to climate justice. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, and I would just like to say thank you very much to everyone who has uh, spoken this evening and to everyone who has come along. Um, it was fantastic, really inspiring uh, and very informative. So thank you uh, so much for that. Um, really, really impressed. And I hope everyone at home uh, was able to enjoy and feel uh, that they've gotten something more out of that um, this afternoon.
Um, so I think we've got a slide to come up just now with some more information. Um, so thank you very much to uh, everyone for coming along and listening. Uh, thank you very much to our speakers. Um, and thank you very much to um, our youth steering group who helped us pull this uh, event together. Thank you so much, guys. Um, we couldn't have done it without you. Um, I would also just like to say thank you to Scottish Power who have made this project possible with funding. Uh, and thank you very much for that. If you are interested in finding out some more um, about the Climate Change Youth Project, you can get in contact with me, which is kate.kirkwood at rspb.org.uk. There are events happening around this weekend um, called From the Ground Up, which is being uh, hosted by the COP26 coalition uh, that Rachel mentioned earlier, and tomorrow is their Youth Day. Um, there is a 6.30 session of this event uh, happening again this evening and you can join us for that. Um, and also just keep an eye out um, on RSPB Scotland for updates uh, on events that will be happening over the next year linked in with this project. Thank you very much to everyone for attending. Thank you to all the speakers and thank you once again. <laughs>